Rag Fair was a dark and dingy corner of London's East End, where the poor bartered over cheap rags of old second-hand clothes. There were streets and alleys around Houndsditch and Petticoat Lane where the aristocracy never ventured, or probably never knew even existed, but their cast-off clothes ended up there, tattered and torn. They found new owners on the backs of the working classes. In this video, you will learn about this mysterious location with an early Victorian account of its peculiarities, told in the author's own words. For hundreds of years, Rag Fair was a hive of commerce, but all this trade was carried on in the most unpleasant conditions, amongst disgusting filth. Find out why Rag Fair truly deserved to be called Rotten. Before we move on, please consider clicking the subscribe button for more content like this. If you find this video interesting, I would really appreciate it if you could give it a thumbs up and share it widely with friends and family. You can also support the channel and get access to exclusive perks by becoming a channel member. Check out the Join button and description for more. Ask any half dozen persons you meet who have been from 20 to 30 years in London, whether they have ever been in Rag Fair, and five out of the six will answer you in the negative. The probability is that four of the number may not be able to tell you in what locality it is situated. Very likely, too, if not three, may inform you that they have never heard of such a place. And yet, there is not a scene in London more worthy of being witnessed than that which Rag Fair exhibits. The place in which the fair is held is in the vicinity of Houndsditch. It begins at the end of Cutler Street, leading out of Houndsditch, and proceeds about seventy or eighty feet in an eastward direction. It then embraces a narrow street called White's Alley, Extending about a hundred feet towards the north, hence it again takes an eastward turn, proceeding in a direct line and extending as far as Petticoat Lane, where it turns to the north and south, probably the entire length of the locality graced by the presence of the patrons of Rag Fair, maybe nearly a quarter of a mile, while the width of the space it occupies varies with the breadth of the streets and lanes in which it is held. The largest of these lanes is dark and dirty. It is quite an era in its existence to be illumined by even the most momentary gleam of sunshine. Anyone would find it a perfectly safe speculation to wager any sum his opponent might be pleased to accept that for eight consecutive months of the year, namely from September to May, the sun will not show his face on the pavement of the leading street. It is never dry, while the dust is flying in all directions to the serious inconvenience of the eyes, the throat and the nostrils. In the other streets and lanes of the metropolis, the centre of this dark, dirty street exhibits a Thames in miniature. Let no one suspect me of exaggeration or hyperbole when I say that, for centuries past, there has been a substance, at least ankle-deep, constituting a compromise between water and mud in this particular spot. There are persons who, for the space of half a century, have been eyewitnesses to the fact, and who are ready at any time to bear their attestation to it, and these parties state that they have heard their parents vouch for the same fact as regarded another half-century before their time. Whence the moisture comes is a problem beyond the powers of my philosophy to solve. One would suppose that the rain cannot be the author of it, because it is a perfect puddle when the metropolis has been suffering a severe drought of several weeks' continuance. I am rather inclined to the hypotheses, though I advance it with becoming modesty, that the fact is to be chiefly accounted for from the circumstance of the water which the Jews who inhabit the lane are in the practice of emptying into it, intermingling with the dirt, and, after thus resolving itself into the consistency 
of mud, continuing in the same form, in consequence of there being neither sunshine, nor wind, nor drought, to interfere with it. But be the causes what they may, the fact is, as I have stated. At what particular period Rag Fair was instituted is a point which none of our metropolitan antiquaries, so far as I know, have been able to ascertain. That it has existed for centuries is beyond question. There are historical proofs to that effect. It is held every day in the week, Saturday and Sunday accepted. The reason why there is no fair on Saturday is that the Jews, by whom it is chiefly frequented, hold their Sabbath on that day. The reason of it not being held on our Sunday is that the law, or rather the local authorities, will not allow it. The fair may be said, fairly, to commence at half-past one. In the summer season it is kept up, with great spirit, until about six. In winter the traffic ceases, and the buyers and sellers quit the place of merchandise, when it becomes too dark to inspect the ragged commodities in which they deal. As for the origin of the name of this fair, there cannot be two opinions. It clearly derives the appellation of rag from the circumstance of ragged clothes being the staple commodity in which its patrons deal. It is preeminently a place of rag. The people in it, some thousands in number, may be said, in a double sense, to be a mass of rags. <laughs> Their arms and backs and shoulders are loaded with articles of cast off apparel, which have all the appearance of having served the purpose of targets, while those which grace their persons are, it may be said with the utmost confidence, incomparably more tattered and torn than was the apparel of the amorous rogue, so celebrated in nursery lore, who kissed the maiden all forlorn. Though worlds depended on the decision, you could not tell whether the heap of clothes in their arms or the mass on their persons is the more valuable. Nor is it in the matter of apparel only that the personal appearance of the merchants harmonizes with the merchandise. The most striking accordance obtains throughout. The article of soap, as applied to their hands or faces, seems to be prescribed on principle. Judging from their aspect, you would imagine it was as much a part of their creed, religiously to abstain from the use of soap, as it is to avoid the contamination of pork. Talk of the assemblage of radicals as being the unwashed. Why, it is a misapplication of terms, a positive perversion of language. To speak in this way of any congregation of universal suffrage politicians that ever lent their ears to the oratory of Mr. Fergus O'Connor or Dr. Wade, while Rag Fair can boast of its merchants, they are literally the unwashed of clean water they have a positive, a practical, if not theoretical, horror. A person with a clean face or a decent coat on his back is a sort of rara avis in rag fare, and when he does make his appearance he cannot fail to excite the special wonder of the buyers and sellers who congregate in that classical locality. The quantity of old clothes in rag fare is truly astonishing. It is difficult to imagine whence the articles can all have come. One would suppose the worn-out apparel of the whole population of London was exhibited in it. In addition to the loads under which the thousands of Jews, men, women, and children who stand in the marketplace groan, there are tables and forms in front of every door and window on either side of the streets and lanes and alleys on which are mountains of old Clo, of course, as hats, according to the notions that nowadays prevail in the world, are considered an essential part of one's wardrobe, there is no lack of chapeaux in this mercantile region, and what is more, they are in the most perfect harmony with the articles of wooden manufacture. The buyers and sellers who congregate in Rag Fair are thorough men of business, 
They are persons of few words. They have no time for talking, unlike their brethren in Monmouth and Holywell Street, who systematically ask three times as much as they will be glad to accept. They ask the lowest price, or within two or three pence of it. In the first instance, How much? says Moses, snatching a coat or waistcoat or pair of trousers from the arms or shoulders of Solomon, and giving it a hasty inspection. One and six pence, answers the latter. Take one and two pence, says the former. No, remarks Solomon, and therefore Moses tosses the article of old Clow contemptuously out of his arms, and marches away with a snarlish expression of countenance. Every word they speak, every glance of their eye, every movement they make, shows how eager the frequenters of Rag Fair are to do business, and unless they did use dispatch in their transactions, they could never manage to carry on their traffic, for it is to be remembered that a whole suit of apparel is usually sold for half a crown, so that, even supposing they got it for nothing, instead of perhaps paying two shillings for it, their profit would not be large. Who the consumers, if that is the proper word, of the commodities vended in Rag Fair are, has always been to me an insolvable problem. Now and then you may see some wretched Spitalfields weaver bargaining for and eventually buying a suit of rags, to call them clothes were a misnomer, for one and nine pence, or two shillings. But to see Christians of any class in rag fair is a comparative novelty. Not only does the large assemblage consist of Jews, but almost every person you see appears in the capacity of merchant. All have a greater or less quantity of tattered apparel to dispose of. I ought to add that all are buyers as well as sellers, for the commodities are perpetually changing hands. I could never, or very rarely, observe any article so disposed of going out of the market altogether. I wish that some of our political economists or free trade theorists would turn their attention to the commerce of rag fair. It strikes me that they would have some difficulty in reconciling its transactions with their principles and systems. (laughs) <laughs> Did the various articles of worn-out apparel which are exposed for sale in Rag Fair but choose to be communicative, what wondrous and romantic tales could they not unfold? Just look at that waistcoat. It is worn to a shred. It is so utterly faded that you do not know what its original colour was. You would not give eighteen pence for it, and yet... Two years ago, it encircled the breast of one of the leaders of the fashionable world. It has dazzled the eyes of hundreds of the votaries of dissipation at Almack's Devonshire House, the opera, and the other resorts of the aristocracy. It has been probably admired in conjunction with its then dashing owner by more than one of the loveliest in person and noblest in birth of England's titled daughters. Ask it, where now is he who then wore it in all the pride of his heart? Possibly its answer would be that, as in the case of many of the other devotees of the goddess of fashion, his desire for display has involved him in moral as well as pecuniary ruin, and that he is now in as degraded a situation as the waistcoat itself an outcast from all society, if not immured in rags and misery in some of the prisons of the metropolis. This is no imaginary picture, neither is it a rare one. Many an article of apparel is exhibited for sale in rag fair, which, some years previously, often graced the aristocratic drawing-room, while its then possessor has descended in the scale of circumstances and station in society with a corresponding rapidity. Where is the difference between Almax and Rag Fair in the case of a coat or waistcoat, and Devonshire House and one of the desolate and dingy cells in the Queen's Bench prison in the case of an individual? The descent is as great, the degradation as deep, 
in the one instance as in the other. There are other articles of wearing apparel in Ragfair which, could their language be understood, could recite tales of distress, produced not by crime or extravagance, but by misfortune, which would soften the hardest heart and exhort tears from the eyes of persons quite unaccustomed to the melting mood. Inexorable necessity first compelled them to part with a portion of their wardrobe to the pawnbroker. The remainder followed some time afterwards. Unable to redeem any portion of it, the whole is sold, and, after being worn until incapable of adhering to one's person much longer, the articles find their way, in the natural course of things, to rag fair. I never could gaze on the varied assortment of old clothes exhibited for sale in this locality without thinking with myself that were some of the original proprietors of the articles present, they would be overjoyed to regain possession, in their present faded, threadbare, and tattered state, of things which, three or four years ago, when in the height of their prosperity, they threw aside as unfit to be any longer worn, merely because there may have been some slight spot on them. I cannot name an instance, no such instance, consisting with my own individual knowledge, but I feel assured that I am guilty of no undue stretch of the imagination, when I take it for granted that instances have occurred in which persons who have thrown aside apparel which was in excellent condition at the time, have been thankful, when overtaken by reverses, to repurchase for a few shillings the same apparel when worn to shreds from some old clothes merchant in Rag Fair.